Father, I thank you for this day as we celebrate this weekend of those who have laid the ultimate sacrifice. You said no greater love is he that laid down his life for another, and Lord, you showed us the way, and there are so many that have done that for people that couldn't protect themselves, and we thank you for that, Father God. We ask for a blessing over those families, Father God, that are separated from spouses right now, from parents, Lord, that are serving all around this globe to protect people that can't protect themselves, Father God. We thank you for that, Lord, and Lord, we want to recognize Michael Mann, and we thank you, Lord, for his dedicated service to you through this ministry, Lord, and as him and Carol move, Father God, we thank you, Lord, to have a smooth transition, Lord, and that they will, you will direct them and they will be obedient to go to a new ministry, Father God, that will love them, that will encourage them, that will uh, pour into their giftings, that will give them opportunities, Father God, and it will be like a seamless transition, Father God, for Michael and his wife, Lord, that they will just embrace you at a new church home, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity right now to minister to us through your words, Father God. We've, we've been ministered through in song and people sharing your word, Father God. We are so grateful. But right now, Father God, we're coming to you as well to talk about uh, flies. And Lord, we thank you as you're going to minister to us about flies. In the mighty and matchless name of your son, Jesus, amen. Now, I say that because the title today is Flies. And that right away when you see flies, you kind of get a you know, the connotation of a fly is a pesky thing. I mean, you're like swatting them away and, you know, they're irritating. But I titled it this because they are irritating and you'll probably remember this just because of the title. And, and, I'm, I, and I'm hoping we're going to understand the spiritual connotation that you're going to hear today. Um, so the next time you have a fly buzzing around you and irritating, you're going to remember what you're going to hear. All right, and right away, we're going to start in the Word of God in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. Now, I put both these versions on there, up there, so let's read Ecclesiastes 10, 1 from the King James Version. Dead flies cause the anointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in rep, rep, reputation for wisdom and honor. Now, it's kind of hard for us to understand, so a, a, a version that's more in line with the way we speak English is the NIV version, which says, as dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. And the beginning of this scripture here is kind of the theme, if you will, of this message. And I want to define what an apothecary is. It's, it's a priest that specializes in making holy anointing oil, or as it said in the NIV version, perfume. All right, now, where did that come from? Well, Again, put up the next two scriptures, Exodus 30, verse 25. And again, I put up two here so we can maybe make sure we understand. Exodus 30, verse 25 from the King James Version reads, And thou shalt make it an oil of holy anointment, an anointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. oil. And then in the NIV version, it is, Make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fra fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil. So, we got to understand that this making of the anointing oil was not done, you know, without proper direction and guidance. It's not just something they, they went around and make light of this. This was, this was an art. You had to have skill. There was direction. There was guidance to this anointing oil formula. There's instructions in the Bible for this. And it was significant because those that received this anointing oil would be separated to receive the thoughts, the visions, the dreams, the purposes of God. So they'd take pure virgin olive oil and they'd mix it with some spices and it would make a sweet fragrance. So much so that the women that when they would be in the temple or the tabernacle would not wear perfume. Right? Because the anointing oil had such a sweet smelling aroma that there was no need for women to wear perfume due to the presence of God that the anointing oil symbolized. All right? Now, you might be saying, well, okay, this is all pretty great stuff, but what's the correlation of the dead flies, right, in the oil will send forth a stinking smell that we started with in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 today? 
And, and in order to understand this, we have got to hear about the symbolism of what a fly represents spiritually, as well as some, I want to share some background as we're doing that to help us answer this question. For instance, Jesus and the Pharisees had kind of a discussion about this, and there's, they're, they're quoted a few times referring to this in the Gospel of Matthew, for instance, with a reference about a fly to Beelzebub. Now, here's a little background we need to dig into before we can explain even further about, we've got to understand what Beelzebub, this was a name, Beelzebub. Now, Beelzebub is a form of the name Baal. Now, Baal worship was very common in Scripture. If you look throughout the Old Testament, you're going to run into God warning them, the prophet saying, stop Baal worship. Okay? And under this aspect of worship, Baal worship is viewed as the producer of flies. And therefore able to control this pest that wasn't a very common thing, the fly. So, for instance, let me, let me share with you in 1 Kings chapter 16, starting with verse 30, and I read from the Amplified Version of the Bible. And Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all before him. As if it had been a light thing for Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, he took for a wife Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah, which is an adulterous symbol of the goddess Asherah. It, was, it would be an Asherah pole. They'd have a pole with, made in the image of Asherah, which is a, a, a form of another idol. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel before him. So, just in case you might be keeping score on the good-bad scale, Ahab's bad. And I would encourage us all to read what Ahab did so we don't make the same mistake. If you read something that Ahab did, you'd be very wise to do the opposite. Okay? Now, Yahweh, God, Jehovah, continually condemn, condemns the worship of Baal. And the Lord sends his prophets to warn the people of this idolatry of worshiping Baal. That's what I was saying before, right? And because Queen Jezebel, right, she, she's this Phoenician wife of King Ahab, she has 450 prophets of Baal as her court counselors, as her counselors, and right, there, these would be what we would refer to as false prophets. They would be called her yes men. Because if they didn't do what she said, she'd have them killed. If you're around somebody that doesn't like what you're doing and basically kind of kills you, there's a problem. Just because you're speaking the truth. Like, Pastor Dina gets up here and shares from Jeremiah. That's exactly what Jeremiah, they're not going to listen to me because I'm young, you know, whatever the reason. People will... People of God are going to say, I don't want them because I want them to like me. Here's what we need to have as our priority, God liking us. God liking us more than you. I want God to be, to be saying, well done, Adam, vice you saying, good job, Adam. I mean, it's nice to hear, but it's much more important that the Lord would say, well done. Then they go, oh, well, that's not done so well, because, but you got uh, thousands of people following you, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel? Hmm, right? Now, there's a great battle uh, described in the Bible when Elijah, a prophet, challenges these prophets of, of Baal worship that were uh, being the yes men for Queen Jezebel on Mount Carmel. It's, it's recorded for us in 1 Kings 18, and I'm not like going to have it up on the screen. But what is basically going on, maybe you've heard it, Elijah is frustrated with this constant worship. He says, that's it. We're having the out-and-out -out contest. You all come, you make your altar, and whoever can bring your God or my God will bring down fire from heaven. Well, that'll resolve the issue. Agreed? And they said, yep. He said, bring all the people to watch this battle. 
So they all come to Mount, Car Mount Carmel, and he tell, they make an altar, and he, they bring on the sacrifices, and he lets them go first. And they're doing this for hours. And these, these prophets of Baal also cut themselves, and they just do some weird, wacky, unscriptural things, okay? And they're waiting, and nothing's happening. And, and Elisha kind of gets a little bit cocky. It's kind of like talking to, he's really giving them, you know, as, as, think about any sport game, and he's going, oh, wow, where's your God, man? I, I see no fire. He goes, okay, you done? They're like, okay, move aside. I'm going to build an altar. So he gets 12 stones, each representing the tribes of Israel, builds his altar. And then he says, hey, I want you guys to douse this. He makes a little moat around it, and he says, bring water. Put it on there. I mean, I want this stuff to be wet so you're going to see how great my God is. So he, done. He, goes, he does it one time. He says, come on. Do it a second time. So they do it. Do it a third time. Bring in all buckets uh, of water. And it has so much water, it fills up the moat around the altar. And then Elijah says, Oh, great God of Jehovah. And, and, all, and the fire comes down. And they kill. The people then listen to Elijah and kill the 450 false prophets. I hope you knew that story. See... Yahweh proved to be the true God. Baal worship was a powerful attraction to the people of Israel and eventually led to their destruction and exile. This is applicable to us. There are so many items that we would, could refer to as Baal worship in our lives. And every single one of them lead to destruction and can lead to exile. What does that mean? That means you think you're not worthy enough to be in, in God's family. It's that very thing where we go, I'm not worthy enough. Maybe my kids can be, but I'm not worthy enough. That is a lie from the devil, and it's, and it's Beelzebub's lie to you to think you can't get up, get up and do it again. You repent, and you get back in and say, God, I am sorry. That's what you need to do. See, and so what happened to the, remember now, the, the kingdom of Israel was separated into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So the northern kingdom wanted idolatry and God's a, God made us to have free will he goes you do what you want you have a choice right and he goes you choose to worship idolatry fine I'm gonna give you over to Assyria the southern kingdom had the same problem they wanted idolatry and so the Lord gives them over to Babylon both lands filled to the brink with idolatry that's exactly the scripture that Pastor Dina was talking about that Jeremiah was speaking they were in captivity in Babylon they were in exile because they as a culture worshiped idols and God said, have it your way. Have it your way. Right? So Baal was the principality that controlled that kind of time frame that you read about in the Bible. And it's recorded. Okay? Now, another terminology that we could use to help us understand this is a reference to the strong man. Remember, the Bible says in Ephesians 6.12, the powers and principalities, all that, that's referring to a strong man. You know, I don't know if you <clears throat> remember this artist in the 60s. He, he was a young man, Bob Dylan. Dylan wrote a lot of songs. You know, he has a pretty funky voice, folk singer. He wrote this. He goes, you're going to have to serve somebody. You may serve the devil or maybe the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, that's the fact for each one of us. We're going to have to serve somebody. Right? Who are you going to serve? There's only two choices. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Satan? That's it. Baal worship is Satan worship, right? I mean, Satan, he's the true original leader of the hell's angels, okay? So Jesus taught us that before we go and plunder the goods, we have to bind the strong man. Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. So, and it's very obvious that flies, when we get to flies, so I'm giving us examples of these things that are equating to flies, that flies fly okay and in, in the air but are you aware that one of the names of Satan is the prince of the air all right and so spiritually flies represent evil thoughts evil plans evil desires so when those flies actually land in the pure anointing oil located in the temple located in the tabernacle what happens is those flies then are stuck and they will die okay 
They die in that which is holy, that which is sacred, that which is anointed, and sweet smelling. But now it's going to have a stinking smell because of the dead flies. Now, that's no different than today because we need to be very careful with these temples. Okay? What I'm getting at is we got to be careful of what we see and what we hear and what we think and what we feel and what we say. All right? We are the temple of God. We're separated. We're separate, set apart. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple, right? That's scripture. You are the temple of God. So those pesky flies that come around us, they bring shame. They bring guilt. They bring fear. They bring doubt. They bring unbelief. Andrew started today talking about that story he had where he doubted God. That he's acknowledging, he's repenting, he's sharing his testimony. Andrew comes in front of us all and says, man, I made a mistake. That is the kind of person that God says, I can use somebody that'll be humble enough to admit they made a mistake in front of somebody else. Instead of, instead of masking it. Okay? See, the prince of the air, Satan, he tries to do this stuff to prevent us from living in the fullness of what the shed blood of Jesus did for us. Michael Mann just shared exactly what this ministry is about. We want to teach, train, and equip you to understand what it means to be a born-again Christian so that you are bold, so that you believe it, so that you live it, so that you're not only spending time having this woe is me, I'm a born-again Christian, but I don't have any power because I'm waiting to be perfect. You will never be perfect. He's perfect, but because he's perfect and he's in you, you can do great and mighty things. Now, the flies are representing thoughts that mean you can't. Okay? See, another example. I want to give us a couple more examples in the Bible, in the Scripture. The Bible talks about a covenant God made with Abraham that's recorded in Genesis 15. Abraham's job during this covenant, he, it, God told Abraham, go get a heifer, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old goat, and a three-year-old lamb, and get a pigeon and a dove, I believe. It's in Genesis 15. And then he said, cut them in half, not the birds, but cut the animals in half, and separate them, and in between, I will walk and we'll make a covenant. Abraham's job after he did this, the Bible says, is there were these types of birds, those, you know, probably vultures, crows, ravens, those predatory birds that were trying to come and get the meat, that he had to keep away from this because this was God's sacrifice. This is what God said to do. And it says Abraham. So in that case, these birds were coming to try to prevent this from manifesting. Another example of a, of a bird is Jesus shares in the parable of the four talents. He says one of the types of soil you put the seed in, birds will come to steal the seed. So and I'm, I'm just telling you to snatch away the seed. And I'm just telling us this, that these are spiritual references, in this case using birds. So please don't leave here or think I said that birds are bad. Okay? They're just used as a connotation here to understand a spiritual development. All right? And it's just like the flies. All right? Now, again, one of the, another meaning of Beelzebub is Lord of the Flies. Now, in researching this, I love to do some research. We find something very interesting about the anointing oil at the Temple of Solomon. There was this family that was appointed by the Sanhedrin, that's like the, a group of the priests, that would specifically deal with the incense used in the temple, at the golden altar. Now, the, uh, and the Temple Institute in Jerusalem lists that there, confirms that there were 11 different spices that that was used in this temple incense. Now, now, several of these spices are mentioned in Scripture, but those not mentioned were handed down by what is called the oral traditions of the Jews. Now, this family had a secret herb that it caused the incense to rise straight up, the smoke that comes from the incense to rise straight up. The smoke never went to the right or to the left. It went straight up. So when the priests would, would get the coals burning from the brass altar and and mix them with the incense, the, the incense would then begin to burn and it would go straight up, all right? And it's just like what Psalm 141 uh, verse 2 says, our prayers go up like incense before God. That makes sense. You know, you want them to go straight up. You don't want your prayers going sideways or left, right, or right, or going down. You want them to go to God. So 
This family making the incense were eventually replaced by another family. But the original family never told the new incense making secret to the family that you know, followed them, that made the smoke go straight up. So the, when the priest then came to do it the next time to burn the incense, the incense didn't go straight up and it started to fill and everything and it was all confusing and frustrating. So what was done according to Jewish history, recorded here in the, temple, in the, in the Jewish Temple Institute, was they got the original family to come back and make the incense and they did it by paying them double to do this assignment. Now stay with me here because you might think, man, they're greedy. They had them. They were just, you know, supply and demand. Boy, I'm just going to up my price. But wait, there's more. They were asked, why didn't you tell the secret of what makes the incense go straight up? Here's their answer. Our fathers passed on a tradition to us that one day the holy temple will be destroyed. We did not want to teach our secret so that it would not fall into the wrong hands, the hands of idolaters. Now, here's something else that was also told about this family. None of the women in their family was ever to put on perfume. And when one of them would marry, they, they made an agreement that the woman would, wear, would never wear perfume at all because they didn't want anyone suspecting that they used the secret incense formula, formula for their own personal use. Now, what I'm getting at is to what the flies and the oil and the bad smell is talking about, you know, getting at that, but I got to finish this thought. Everything, folks, that we hear about what was done in the temple or the tabernacle, right, is a picture of something that's in the New Testament so that we have a greater understanding of how to take care of this temple. It's for our benefit, right? The old is the new contained and the new is the old explained. In the Old Testament, it's giving us instructions. You might have think, man, I don't need to be concerned about the temple or the tabernacle and all that stuff. Yes, you do. Because it's the proper foundation to understand how to take care of this temple where the Holy Spirit resides right now. I hope this is making sense, okay? Now, see, one of the things to grasp, many people always go, listen, when the pattern is right, the glory falls. And so you've got to remember that. Like if there are things we're doing wrong, you've you got to understand, he gave us the instructions here in the word, right? And I'm not trying to be legalistic here, but these are mysteries and secrets and revelations that the priest, prophet, and king need to understand. We're, we're that today because we're the royal priesthood, Okay? We are kings and priests in the order of Melchizedek, the Bible says. We need our prayers going straight up to God and not being scattered because we lack knowledge. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So I'm trying to feed us some knowledge today about understanding why it's imperative that we know this. All right? And our, as, as you're hearing this, I believe our faith should be arising. We should be gaining in faith. It should be like the Holy Spirit in us to be like, man, this is good stuff. This is good food. Now on to this anointing oil which was made to anoint you, the royal priesthood. Now, all throughout Scripture, Christians are, are and, 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 and sheep in the Bible are referred to as Christians. All throughout the Bible, when you hear about a sheep, it, you, that's us. It's talking about a Christian. We're the sheep. He's the good shepherd. We're the sheep. A believer who follows the good shepherd, Jesus. For some of us, it's obvious, but I just want to make sure we're all starting at the same point now as I continue. Because we started out with Ecclesiastes 10, verse 1, regarding flies getting in the anointing oil that send forth a stinking smell. The flies represent the thoughts and the attacks that come into our minds and influence us to pull away from the anointing on our lives. Or pulls us away from our prayer life. Or pulls us away from reading the Word of God which in ter turn pulls us away from understanding that the presence of God is right here. So let's take something in the natural and apply it to the spiritual. I want us to read Psalm 23, 1 through 5. And I know many of us know this scripture. Here it is. Psalm 23, starting with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'd, I'd ask you all to join me. Let's read this. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. 
Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. All right, so I want to focus on verse 5. He anointed our head with oil. I'm going to camp there for a while. In the natural, why, oh, why would a shepherd rub oil on the head of a sheep? Now think about a sheep. Why would they do that? And I'm telling you, if you're a farmer, you know what I'm talking about. If you've been around any animal, it's not just sheep, but in this case, the sheep represent a Christian, right? Because flies are all over the place, and especially around animals, and furthermore, because flies hang around dung, okay? And the animals are always doing the dung, and you've got to clean them up, okay? Now, flies do something very specific to many animals, but we're focusing on sheep here. So flies land on a sheep's head and lay their eggs on the sheep's head. If you didn't know that, that's what they do. All right? Now, in case this might not, you know, I'm just, I want to make sure we all understand this because some of you might not realize this, but sheep have no hands. <laughs> they can't scratch their head. All right? So what does a sheep do if they can't scratch their head? They butt heads. They butt heads. Have you ever seen it? I have. Because they've got an itch, right? So, they're agitated in their minds, right? They're agitated. How about a Christian? Do Christians ever butt heads? I wonder if that ever happens at Freedom Destiny, for instance. This expression that people butt heads, which means having a disagreement, it means something has agitated their minds. See, people that are at peace with each other are not going to be in conflict with each other. If the sheep are butting their heads, it's possible they could become injured if you do it hard enough and long enough or severe enough. Is this starting to make sense? And in the church... Those of us that don't resolve disagreements can become injured if we don't meet and resolve our issues. Here, you got to hear both sides of the story, folks. Get in line with what the leadership and vision of the ministry is. Then forgive, say you're sorry. It's okay to disagree, folks. It's okay to disagree, but here's the deal. When you disobey, then the leader is forced to take action. Any of you parents know what I'm talking about? Okay? It's no different in church. It's no different where you work. You disagree with what the boss says, he's like, hey, here's your pink slip, you're fired. He might give you a couple of warnings, right? Give you a review, we got to write you up, you're reprimanded, all those kinds of things. But if you keep that practice, you're done, okay? Because, see, we share with everybody that comes through here at Freedom Destiny in Connects One. If you go to Connects One and meet Pastor Candace and me, <coughs> we tell you <coughs> during that, we talk about a few things, but for you, your responsibility is, of the sheep, is you are not supposed to sow discord. For those of you, is that making sense? Okay? Now, one of our responsibilities, just one of them, is to teach, train, and equip you so that you can do the work of the ministry. So, if you are sowing discord, I'm held accountable by God, if you're here, to come and dialogue with you to say, knock it off. The elders are held accountable by God to come and talk with you if we find out things. I'm wanting to make sure because we're tired of watching the sheep hitting heads. Oh, I know I'm speaking to somebody here. The elders of your church are required to come find you, to talk to you, to just make sure, hey, is everything okay? Because, boy, I mean, I didn't, you know, they might say, I didn't grow up on a farm, but, boy, it sounds like you're doing that very thing that the pastor was talking about where you're butting heads. Are you, are you getting injured? Are you hurt? Because it can cause some severe pain. And you get hurt. And how do people do that that get hurt? When the elders, you know, if the elders come and talk to them, you know what some people do? They have a choice. They usually are flat out the door. They're going, I'm so sorry. You're right. But that's when people fly out of the churches. Because they're like, oh, who do they think they are? They can't tell me what to do. I'm a Christian. I, I've got grace. I've got freedom. It's freedom destiny, for goodness sakes. We can do whatever we want. We're free. I, I'm not making this up, folks. People actually say those things. I'm not making this up. I'm just sharing with you that these flies 
buzz around our head and get in the anointing oil. And they make a stinking, smelling savior. And we've got to realize this and get rid of it. How do you get rid of it? You dialogue with the person that's irritating you. You get to the bottom of the thing. And you repent, say you're sorry, forgive. Yay! There to go, family. That's what we need you to do. Come on. Mm. Mm. See, so the shepherds here with these sheep, they'd make this anointing oil, they'd make this mixture, and they'd put it on the head of the sheep. And you know what would happen? The flies wouldn't land there. Now, I don't want us to miss the spiritual application. David says in Psalm 23, the anointest my head with oil. It's not just like pouring olive oil on the head of the sheep, okay? This mixture, now, the olive oil and in the, the olive trees in Israel, more, more research, and I, I wish I would have been able to go there because I would have asked this question with the group that recently wet, went, but um, I was told by what I was reading that the olive trees in Israel, where the olives come from, uh, the oil there and everything, they have leaves on them all year round. And I was, the shore is watching around. Um, they say they have the leaves on it because olive tree leaf has a substance in it that is bitter. So its leaves can't be taken out by insects. And so what are those flies then raising up against? They, they raise up against an evil thought or an evil emotion or an evil desire. See, we've got to grasp this because it goes on with us all the time if we allow it. If we allow it. God's a gentleman. He is going to allow you to think evil thoughts. He is going to allow you to worship Baal. He is. He is not going to force you. He's going to tell you. He's going to use people to instruct you. Usually our parents are some of those people. If you're a part of a ministry, your pastor, the elders, you know, when you, if you own a business or you're in charge of people, you are instructing people. You understand the concept. If you're a parent, you understand the concept. But at a certain point, after you've raised people up, you have to allow their free will choices to play out because we're a stiff-necked people and it's the only way we learn. In other words, we have to hit rock bottom many a times for us to realize that God is God and I'm not. That's the truth, folks, right? And here's another thing. We, way too often, here's the reality, is that these evil thoughts will lay dormant and appear to be harmless. Right? For instance, we could be watching something on, you know, TV or watching a movie. That's not the best thing your eyes should be, you should be letting in your eye gate. But we do it because we're, no, we're, we're good. I'm good. But huh, we may have some conviction while watching it. And then what happens is that egg will just lie there and in our mind. And what happens is those eggs multiply. And then it's like that fly starts to buzz around our head and distract us from being able to hear the voice of the Lord. Because we keep doing that stuff over and over. We say, nah, I'm good. Then we compromise here and we compromise there and we compromise here and we compromise there. Before we know, we're in tears. We're on our knees going, God, help me. And he's like, okay, it's time I help because you finally got to the point where you know you can't do it anymore because you keep watching the wrong things that I've been telling you not to watch. Hello? Hello? See, our anointing, when we get, we see, our anointing initially smells very good. The anointing which is consecrated, the anointing which causes the incense to run straight up to, into heaven, all of a sudden smells like, like dead flies, in, right? And it doesn't ascend. It's lingering around because we're doing wrong stuff. And don't you know that dead flies will attract more live flies? So the longer we allow some evil thoughts to stay in our mind without getting help, ah, here's where humility comes in, I need some help. It will attract more of those evil thoughts and it will multiply and then it will become a stronghold and the principality in our lives. Flesh beget flesh. Evil thoughts begat evil thoughts. Or on the flip side, holy thoughts begat holy thoughts. That's why you're here. You're here to get things holy. You're here to get things right today. But I'm telling you, we're almost done. In this session, we're meeting together. This is my pep talk. Right? Because you're going to go out and play the game. 
It's the locker room talk because you're going out there to play the game. And you're going to have to run into many of those same situations and make the decision, ah, it's okay, I'm good. Or not today. You know what? Today I'm going to do something different. Today I'm going I'm to actually do something holy and righteous because God's holy and righteous and because I believe in his son, I'm holy and righteous and I'm not going to do that stuff anymore and I'm not going to abuse his grace and I'm not going to abuse his mercy and I'm going to get rid of these stinking flies in my thought process. The stinking flies in my speaking process. The stinking flies in my feeling process where my feelings dictate every single step and word I, I speak. Hmm. The Bible tells us that salt can lose its saltiness and light can become dim. And therefore, anointing then can become stale. And I'm, I'm talking about the anointing can become stale because we didn't do what Michael Mann just encourages to is his serve. The anointing gets stale if you're not serving. It's just sitting there. It needs to be used. You have the anointing. You need to be used. You need to be used and emptied up and then get filled back up again so you can be used again. And that's the cycle. I'm going to ask the band to come back up here. See, we have an anointing from God, but we still choose to get caught up in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of self. And that not only chokes the word of God, but it also chokes the anointing on us. For some of us that have been around a while, what I am saying is that we at times allow ourselves to settle in the joy or anointing we felt, we felt yesterday, we experienced yesterday. And that's great. Hallelujah. Have a great party and celebration of that. But today's a new day with a great opportunity to do greater and more things. See, we have to maintain the joy which comes through the Holy Spirit. Folks, there is nothing like coming into a church service like you are right here, right now. And you've been, maybe you came in a little down and out today. And it's as if God's Spirit touches us. It, he, he, you know, quickens us. And that's the refreshing of getting the fly eggs out of our head. Ask God to kill those evil fly eggs off your head and give us fresh thoughts and anointing to believe for a healing, to believe for restoration. Not to be critical, but sanctified for success and occupy my mind with your thoughts, God. The Bible says in Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So I'm emphasizing today, I believe God is all over this service today because I didn't know about Pastor Dina coming up here and talking to us. I knew Michael Mann was going to come up. I mean, he's these are all the same threads within this about anointing in our lives. F folks, these flies represent dead thoughts, bad thoughts, evil thoughts, you know, narcissistic thoughts. Thoughts that are not of God. Thoughts that are all about us playing defense. No, we have the best offensive weapon in the world and that's Jesus Christ. If you're here and you don't know about Jesus Christ, and maybe that some of the things you're hearing are describing what's going on in you, and you're like, man, I've been, I've been pondering if I should receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Many of us out here have, but maybe we just need to rededicate ourselves to Jesus Christ. We need to repent and rededicate our sides because we've got too many flies in our anointing oil, and it stinks and it smells. Folks, you believe in Jesus Christ. We confess it out of our mouth. That is what he said to do, once and for all, and it's done. We partake in communion in the back, throughout, where the lights are. And we do that to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have the altar team up here that maybe today a lot of people are going to need to come up to the altar, not necessarily to the people that are up here, but yourselves, to so just come up here and acknowledge some of this stuff that's in your life, in your thought process, that is stinking, that smells to high heaven, that you need to repent of. Folks, we should be shouting, we should be screaming of the joy of the Lord, of what Jesus Christ has done for us and offers for us. Let's rise to our feet and continue worshiping Him.